Hello again, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today um, and coming into today's virtual um, program. My name is Martha Osterbeel, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Uh, before we get started, I want to provide a content warning. Um, today's conversation may include references to racial violence and racial terror. Um, as a designated member of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we've been looking forward to producing this program to highlight the work of the commission and their goal to find truth, healing, and reconciliation surrounding the history of, of lynching in our state. Um, so thanks again for all of you for joining us to learn more about this um, really important um, and painful topic. I'm now going to pass the microphone over to our Director of Education and to my colleague, David Armenti, to introduce our wonderful panelists and get our conversation going. So, David, take it away. Thank you so much, Martha. Uh, very excited to engage in this conversation today, especially since I have my esteemed colleagues here who are um, going to give us some really wonderful uh, perspectives on this traumatic and, and painful history, um, but talk about how we acknowledge it and um, work through it and work forward. So I'm gonna start with Maya Davis, who is the new director of the Rivers Darrell House Museum in Prince George's County. Previously, Maya was the research archivist and legislative liaison at the Maryland State Archives where she consulted on statewide projects to document, interpret, preserve African-American history and culture. Some of her recent projects include the installation of the Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman statues at the Maryland State House and at the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Park. Maya currently serves as a commissioner on the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Maryland Commission on African-American History and Culture and is a board member of the Prince George's County Historical Society. A native Washingtonian, Maya is a graduate of Howard and George Washington Universities. How are you doing today, Maya? I'm doing lovely, David. How are you? Nice you. Good, nice to see you. And we have Dr. David Fakunle, who is a mercenary for change, uh, employing any skill and occupying any space to help elevate everyone divested from their truest self. David serves as an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Florida, an associate faculty at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and his interests include stressors within the built environment, manifestations of racism, and use of arts and culture to strengthen health equity and ultimately liberation. He serves as the chair of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is, as we'll learn, the first state level body in the US chronicling and bringing justice to racial, racial terror lynchings. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, David. David my fellow a, David. Yeah, exactly, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's fancy Dr. David Fockenlay today, but I just want to be dressed up for this occasion, but very happy to uh, be part of this uh, necessary discussion. Thank you for having me. And then last but not least, we have Will Schwartz, who is an independent television producer, EP writer and director based in Baltimore. The award-winning television veteran has more than 30 years of experience creating original nonfiction programming for broadcast, government, and corporate clients. Will's work has been honored with numerous Emmy, Telly, and other industry awards. He is also the founder and president of the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project, a 501c3 organization that works to advance the cause of racial reconciliation in the state by documenting the history of racial terror lynchings, advocating for public acknowledgement of these murders and working to honor and dignify the lives of the victims. How are you doing today, Will? Thank I'm you for great. being with us. I'm my pleasure. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Well, I wanna uh, jump right into it. We have about an hour to, to dig into some really important, but really challenging topics here today. Um, and I think you three are a really wonderful group to, to get us going in that direction. Um, but I do wanna start with Will. And, you know, Will, you're, you're actually the one that, that brought me into these conversations initially several years back um, but thinking about not just the, the commission as it stands today, but how 
issues like racial terror lynchings have been documented and what groups are already working on it. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you started to get involved in this work, particularly what you learned from the Equal Justice Initiative? Yeah, sure. So um, it really started when um, a friend of mine in a, in a book club, actually, uh, who is a, happens to be a federal public defender in Baltimore, um, told me that, told actually all of us in the book club that there was this hotshot civil rights lawyer was going to be coming through talking about his book and I might be interested in seeing him. That was Brian Stevenson. He was um, actually on the, on the book tour for Just Mercy at the time. I hadn't heard of him, um, but I read the book and, and I, you know, I think it's a life altering book actually. So we went to see him and in the, in the course of his um, presentation, um, he mentioned that EJI, the Equal Justice Initiative, had just finished um, its first report on um, lynching in America, and I actually have it here. Um, and that was, um, and uh, you know, it was a revelation because what he um, what he mentioned was that what he what he said was that EJI had been able to document at that time over 4,500 racial terror lynchings in this country, and I I was just completely blown away. And I, I think um, I'm probably not alone in not having realized the, um, the scale of, of, of lynchings that occurred and also the, the depth of the depravity of, of how awful these crimes were. <clears throat> and um, I'm a filmmaker and so I, I, I was interested in that, you know, that report, the first report really concentrated on the um, 11 Confederate states and Kentucky. That's where the lion's share of these awful crimes had occurred. Um, and uh, I thought, well, someone must be doing this in Maryland. And I set out to see if anyone was. And, um, I, you know, I just, I think it's a reflection of my failure as a researcher that I wasn't able to find it, really anyone that was doing it. So I, I set out to kind of start to do some research on my own and worked with a history teacher at a high school uh, close by and we put together a program for his students for after school uh, kind of a thing to work on this and that really kind of um, got me into the subject matter and we did a um, soil collection um, for um, a lynching victim right over here and I'm pointing it's right over here in Towson the jail and that's really what got us started um, at uh, that time um, we um, you know, the, uh, the idea of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission was just percolating. Um, uh, one of our board members, Dr. Nick Creary, worked with a Delegate Penny Melnick, Jocelyn Penny Melnick, on the bill that created it. And so um, that bill was introduced uh, in session, I guess it was 2019, I believe, 2019 legislative session, and it, and it passed, um, and that, that kind of created the, uh, the commission. And, um, so, you know, there are like three entities at work here, the, the EJI, which is, you know, was formed in 1989 and was the, um, is Brian Stevenson's vehicle. We were formed in 2018, we meaning the Maryland Lynching um, Memorial Project, and then the commission, which came into being in, in, 20, in 2019, um, each with, you know, different focus and uh, different um, uh, tasks but all um, dedicated to the, the same mission, which is to um, elevate these, um, this, this, these tragedies and make sure that, uh, that people know about it and know how they continue to affect our lives. Absolutely. And you, know, you, you spoke to the establishment of the commission through legislation. And I don't think that it, it can be glossed over that this was a, a major effort you know, some of that effort behind the scenes with, with you and Nick Creary, um, but also the, the boldness of, of Delegate Pena Melnick to, to put that um, on the floor and, and really push it forward and have the energy to do so um, for something that we all know would be challenging um, and have a lot of work that goes into it. So yes, that bill passed in, in April of 2019 and led to the establishment of the commission. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that she can't be praised enough. She is really a force to be reckoned with, this woman, because you know it's. Um, we should note that uh, two or three years earlier, a similar bill had been introduced, a bill that would have honored, um, created memorials for the lynching victims in the state, and it never got out of committee. So 
you know, a lot to be, she's, she deserves a lot of credit for getting this thing um, through and for having, a, and, and for Maryland being the first and only state to have um, this kind of commission right now. And so once it actually got started, and in addition to yourselves, I, I was uh, brought into that as a, as a designee from my organization, uh, formerly known as the Maryland Historical Society. Um, but, but David Fakunle um, became involved as well through a couple different organizations that he represents. I was wondering, David, could you talk to us a little bit about those early conversations within the commission and how we kind of crafted the, the goals of the commission and, and the process for how to, how to make it work uh, for these purposes? Yeah, well, uh, you know, first it all started with uh, someone raising their hand to be interim chair. And since no one else did it, I raised my hand. <laughs> so once we got through, uh, you know, just kind of the formalities of, of what the leadership would look like, we really got to the task at hand and crafting what our goals were as a commission in addition to um, what our charge was through the law. We all recognized that what we were looking to do was much bigger than the history we were chronicling, bigger than the justice and memorialization that we uh, are, are looking to uh, capture and, and memorialize in a, in, a, in a permanent way. So much of our, our initial conversations uh, included what are the long-term ramifications, what are the long-term uh, impacts that we as a commission could make. We realized that we were in a unique situation because <clears throat> with a lot of truth and reconciliation commissions, they involve people who have experienced uh, the, the injustice, who have experienced the terror. In this case, the victims of, of these crimes against humanity are all deceased. The perpetrators of these crimes of human against humanity are all deceased. Uh, many of the spectators of, of these crimes against humanity are deceased. So our perspective has always been on, again, the, the long-term consequences, the long-term ramifications, the long-term impact of these crimes against humanity. What did it mean for the families? What did it mean for the communities? What did it mean for the systems in which people operated? And, and one of the things that was a part of our initial conversations was even defining lynching. So uh, it's called the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. In reality, we are looking at racial terror lynchings. So we are looking at those acts <clears throat> of murder against a black person for the preservation of a system of oppression, in this case, white power. So it had to be specified that it wasn't just the act of the hanging, which most people are familiar with, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the acts of mutilation, the acts of, of dismemberment, uh, my apologies, but this is what happened. These are racial terror lynchings and lynchings in general, but the fact that it was specifically targeting a group of people, uh, African-Americans, black people, and again, uh, preservation of a system of oppression against those black people, white power. So that, distinction had to be very explicit uh, from the very beginning so that all of our actions, all of our duties could be particularly attuned to what we are looking to to chronicle and capture and bring justice to. So along with that, we <clears throat> had to build this entity, this organization from scratch, our bylaws, what we're going to be our um, procedures, what were going to be our processes. And a lot of those things are still ongoing. This is a living being. This is a living uh, body. So we are always considering how to take the best approach uh, to what we are looking to accomplish. But those were some of our uh, initial discussions, our initial actions, and then also just introducing ourselves to the people. We are a public commission. We are serving the people of Maryland, uh, which include us. And we wanted people to know that we exist, we are here, and we are not going to just do a report. We recognize that this is a critical opportunity to have the discussion, to bring action to an aspect 
of this state's history and this country's history that has been ignored uh, and, and disregarded in many ways. So if not for those local coalitions, if not for local researchers and historians and archivists, we would not have the foundation to be who we are. We wanted to make that story known to the people because this will not happen without the public support, without the public's input, their insight, their, their research, their resources. This is the people saying, we will acknowledge the history of brutality of terrorism within our borders. And it starts with knowing the story and telling the story. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's a very powerful message. And I, I love the way you framed it there. You know, I, I think one of the other important things to acknowledge are the, the individuals or the entities that are involved in the commission. Um, you know, in addition to what was formerly the Maryland Historical Society, now the Maryland Center for History and Culture, um, all of the states, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities are, are represented. Um, several government agencies at the state level are represented, um, including the one that, that Maya formerly worked for until just, just about a month or so ago. Um, so we're, we're all kind of coming at it from um, our perspectives and much of that is academic, right? Whereas some of us, um, like you, David, have a public health background and also some of the people that we've enlisted as, as volunteers or as other support um, and even within the local coalitions bring some of that other experience to the table. Um, so that's all very important as we are kind of publicizing this work here um, over the next one to two years. Um, I did want to bring Maya into it here and talk about that, that aspect of history and research because um, as Will mentioned, some of this stuff was hard to find. Some of it is less represented, I mean, certainly in textbooks, curricula, and, and the public um, at large, but what did we already know about the lynchings that took place in Maryland? What did, what research had already been done, um, particularly through the Maryland State Archives records? And what are, what are our goals to, to kind of build on that and, and find more than just what um, is in the public record there? Thank you, David. Um, this gives me an opportunity to just talk about the complexity in the research, um, especially coming from the Maryland State Archives. Let me point out first that when I came to the Maryland State Archives in 2005, what had been done for Judge Lynch's court, which was the website created to look at lynchings in Maryland, had been done in 2001. So the internet as we know it now was not, you know, as searchable or user friendly. So, you know, it was led by David Taft Terry and he was working with a group of interns and student volunteers. And they were actually going through large bound volumes of newspapers to find this material. And you have to take into consideration that, you know, what the Maryland State Archives has in its holdings is what has been donated by these former newspapers or continuing uh, newspapers. So when you get these large bound volumes, you're looking at a volume that's, massive one and has writing that is about two point font. <laughs> like if you can just imagine how small the writing is. And so you're looking for incidents of lynchings that would have occurred in Maryland. And you know, so we weren't as well versed, I don't think as um, states in the deep south. So what David Terry was able to do in pulling out the 40 lynchings, which we've since found additional lynchings, as well as some of the other groups, such as the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project and its county coalitions and the EJI and Nick Creary. But um, by and large, they were working in a very skewed collection because you have to remember these are all newspapers that were owned by white Southern sympathizing um, editors. And you know the way that they wrote about these stories were very one-sided. The archives was fortunate um, that we do have a couple of issues within the collection uh, that were from the Baltimore Afro, which gave a very different perspective, but um, they were very dependent on those very early newspaper articles. And even though they were biased in their writing, they still make you aware of the incident at that moment. So you have a name, you have a location, um, a county at the minimum, if not a town. But what is a lot of the times missing are the people who are actually involved. So 
in the years I started in 2005, I was the Maryland State Archives for 16 years. We've been able to, you know, find more information over the years by being able to access newspaper databases online. But there's also um, the work of just everyday historians from different universities who are interested in this topic. Uh, Commissioner Nick Creary being one of those um, researchers that actually came into the archives to look at um, lynchings and just discovering um, different collections that we never thought to look at later on because we were focused on different topics such as 19th century slavery or the Underground Railroad. But, you know, when those scholars come in and they want to kind of share that information, it helps us kind of further document. And so we started to look at things like governor's papers to see what the governors were saying about these incidents or even uh, coroner's reports, uh, which, you know, sometimes, you know, depending on the county, you can get a additional information, but sometimes it's very vague and very simplistic and not much is added onto it other than the person is deceased. Um, but, you know, the research is going to be continuing because there's so much we don't know. And we have to remember the fact that these are government records. Um, they are built with a certain bias because in the same way that the newspapers have that bias, government records, we know the history of our state, we know that African Americans have been enslaved in this state. So the way that our history has been recorded is not necessarily one that would lend to being able to document and build a further case for the incidents that occurred. You know, lynching is a taboo topic where, you know, there isn't necessarily a government document that would be able to explicitly lay out what happened that day. Um, all you have are like things like testimonies to different governors or the attorney general or a figure like that. Absolutely. And, you know, David also mentioned earlier that the there probably are not survivors, right? There there probably mm -hmm. are not many witnesses. The The last documented lynching and you know, based on the definition that was developed for the commission occurred in 1933 with George Armwood. So we're talking about over 87 years that have passed um, since one of these incidences actually took place. But, and that limitation of perspective within the record groups is really interesting. And that's part of why this work is so necessary, right? Even if you yes. are um, talking to descendants and gathering oral histories, there are ways of, of building in different perspectives. Um, you mentioned the Afro-American newspaper, you know, it reminds mm -hmm. me of some of the collections that we have, um, including oral histories from Clarence Mitchell Jr., who was working as a reporter for the Afro when the George Armwood incident went down in 1933. So we're definitely building that bank of resources, but also looking to the public um, particularly through the local coalitions um, with the goal um, in our public hearings, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but Will, Will, do you want to talk a little bit about the local coalitions and, and some of the, the, grass work, the grassroots legwork that's being done kind of in parallel with our, our statewide efforts? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. I just want to uh, expand a little bit on the point you just made. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, and that is that, um, you know, it's not just to document history. That's not mm -hmm. the only reason that for, for doing this. I mean, we can see the um, how white supremacy continues to uh, manifest itself in our lives. We have a trial going on in Minnesota today. That was a lynching, right? We can look at other, you know, maybe perhaps more subtle effects. Um, Income disparity, health disparity. Look what the, at the um, at the experience during the COVID epidemic between um, you know black population and and non-black population. I mean the experience is entirely different. M much much greater um, uh, prevalence of the disease, incidence of the disease in the black population. Far uh, fewer, uh, far far less. Um, uh, um, inoculations, vaccinations in that population. So these are all, to me, expressions of white supremacy. And lynching was the most virulent, perhaps, you know, weapon. But I don't think we can take our eyes off off of that because that's one of the reasons for, I think, one of the important reasons for um, continuing to do this work. Um, <clears throat> now. Um, yes, when we started in 2018, the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project, that is, um, we were, we were, there were no, other, you know, local coalitions um, in the state, uh, and we had a mailing list of about 40 people. 
we had a conference that year in October of, of uh, 2018. And that really, I think, was a, an important event for galvanizing public interest in this. We had hundreds of people show up at the Lewis Museum um, with very little publicity. And, you know, to the, and, and what happened, I think, was that people you know, recognized each other, people from Anne Arundel County and, and Montgomery County. And I think also the political situation at the time helped um, um, you know, people see that this is, you know, I think it helped, um, you know, develop a feeling of empowerment um, and responsibility um, for, uh, for addressing these things. So since the, the, you know, since 2018, we now have um, coalitions, county coalitions in um, 14 of the 18 counties where, where these um, crimes occurred. And just for, you know, us, we have, you know, where we had 40 people on our mailing list, then we've got about just south of 2,500 right now. So clearly it struck a chord. I think it's, it's not a difficult um, uh, situation. It's not a difficult issue to understand. Um, and I think the ask is, is, is pretty simple. I mean, what we're asking is for people to um, take an honest look at our history and, and our neglected history and, um, and understand how that can continue um, to influence our lives, continue to affect us. I mean, Cheryl and Eiffel um, describes what she calls a project of reconciliation. And, and she says that a project of reconciliation demands that individuals and communities confront these difficult truths and then take personal responsibility for injustice. And I think the emphasis there is on communities, right? Individuals and communities. It's our responsibility as citizens um, you know, to, to, uh, to, to take a look at this, to understand, to, to make a deliberate effort to um, understand how this continues to influence our lives and to do something about it. Yeah, and a, a, couple, of, a couple of us have mentioned um, not only that continuing manifestation of, of white supremacy and the disparities that exist, but the, the idea of community trauma. I think, David, you were, you were getting at earlier and, you know, thinking about the public health perspective with events like these, it, it definitely comes really into focus when we see it happen in 2020 or 2021. Um, but how does that community trauma um, manifest moving forward in generations? Um, and then also I want to get into what are the goals of the um, public hearings. We haven't gotten to talk about that a little bit. One of the, the major pieces of the legislation um, or the way that we are moving forward as a commission is to um, work within those local communities to, um, to have events that, you know, build in these different components. Um, so, David, could you talk a little bit about that kind of community piece and, and how that leads into the hearings? Yeah, absolutely. When we think about community trauma, sometimes it's hard for people to conceptualize that. So I want people to think about a bad experience that they've had in their lives. It doesn't have to be the worst. Just think of a bad experience, even an awkward experience. And we've all had awkward moments in our lives and kind of make us cringe when we think about it. And no matter how long ago that moment occurred, it still affects you. It can still make you cringe to think about what you did when you were a teenager or you know, a young adult, whatever the case may be. Now think about everyone in your family, your extended family, your neighbors having a horrible experience. So think about the intensity of, of that moment or collection of moments. And everybody has a story related to that collective horrible experience. And it's an experience so horrible that it changes you. Best, the best thing I can recall is September 11th. I was 14 years old when it happened. Remember the day like it was yesterday, despite it being almost 20 years. So think about something that affects you so much that it changes you. It leaves an imprint on your mind that you cannot let go. And ultimately, it affects your behavior, your personal behavior with yourself, with your family, with your friends, whoever. And then those relationships are, are affected to an, a, a point by that. And then that begets other infected. So almost think of it like a virus. So I mean, we're in a pandemic. It, it doesn't go away because it affects so much of your health and well-being that any interaction that you have with someone else is going to be affected by it as well. 
that's collective trauma. And, and that is what racial terror or lynchings have done to communities, black communities in particular around the state of Maryland. Because of what a racial terror lynching was meant to do, it was meant to silence, it was meant to terrorize, it was meant to keep the story private, keep it closed. Our goal as a commission is to continue the outreach and to continue the elevation of those stories. And you're pushing back against generations of people who were told, don't tell that story. Don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. That is hard. You know, people who have stories from 10, 15 years ago that are hard to tell, you know, we know people who have, who have those experiences. Imagine generations of stories like that. And then we're asking those who are still with us uh, those who have done the research, those who have the, the knowledge and understanding to bring all of that to the forefront. That is hard. And again, when you're talking about a traumatic experience, that makes it even harder. So we are, are operating with, with appreciation. We are operating with understanding. We are operating with, with love. We really are because we are asking people to bring forth an experience that perhaps permanently altered, or at least for several generations has permanently altered just the, I don't even know how to put it, just kind of has permanently altered their existence. We have to be mindful of what, how hard that is and remind ourselves of our own experiences, certainly not necessarily on the level of a racial terror lynching, but just those experiences that we know have affected us even to this day. We're asking other people to tell their stories where it may be hard for us to tell our own. So vulnerability is another critical component of this. We, we have to be open with our feelings. We have to be open with our emotions. This is the worst of humanity. Racial terror lynchings are the worst of humanity. And we have other examples in our current world that are examples of the worst of humanity. So these things are not easy to approach and, and to ask people who have dealt and it suffered from that worst aspect of humanity to tell that story and then to chronicle it and then to say, how do we even begin to heal? How do we even begin to bring justice to this? Those are the tough parts of this. Again, the, the victims are gone. The, the perpetrators are gone. Many of the spectators are gone. How do we help the descendants, uh, particularly of the victims, how do we help the descendants heal? again, with the generations of, of pain, the generations of silence that they've had to deal with and endure, how do we even begin to heal? But it does start with the stories. It does start with telling the truth. Again, we all have those moments where we get something off our chest, we literally feel it in our bodies, that we let go of, of a pain, a burden. That's what we're asking people to do as, a, as, as families, as communities, we have to be mindful of that and we have to be open to, to the practices and I think the, uh, the steps that we must take as a commission to make this as easy a process as possible and to re remind everyone involved, commissioners, uh, staff, participants, volunteers, whoever the case may be, that it is about the healing of the families that is at the forefront of what we're looking to do. Because we want to heal, we have to tell the truth. So that's where the truth part comes in but the healing is the reason for all of this. And if we can get to those things, then yes, now we can start to think about justice, but we cannot go down this road without being particularly judicious and particularly mindful of how we are navigating those who still live with this pain to this day. I don't know if Will, Will or Maya wanted to, to add anything to that. Um, but we, we did have, um, we have had a few questions come in through the Q and A and, and I think there might be a, a good opportunity while we have a little bit of time left to, to address some of them and push people toward resources. But, uh, we do have a question, what research and data has been discovered regarding the lynching of blacks in, in post reconstruction or post emancipation to reconstruction? I think the best way to answer that in the limited time that we have is to, uh, forward people to the respective websites of the commission, um, which is hosted through the Maryland State Archives. You can find that um, by searching for the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. 
Um, we also dropped that in the chat earlier where all of the case studies and compiled resources will, will end up. Um, the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project as well has its own page where um, many of those incidents are also broken down by region. Um, so definitely encourage folks to, to visit those after the fact and, and learn more about what has already been documented. Um, but that, that community healing piece and, and, and being sensitive and um, deliberate about it is gonna be a really important part of our, our charge moving forward. Um, as of this point, you know, and, and David, of course you can chime in um, if I'm speaking out of turn, but we're, we're looking toward the fall as well as to 2022 um, to start holding these events, hopefully in the communities where the incidents has happened. Um, and working with, again, the local coalitions that, that uh, Will mentioned and has helped jumpstart some of them um, to, to design what those experiences look like so that it's worthwhile for the commission, but also that it, it brings that healing and it brings those sharing opportunities for, for those folks in the community. No, David, I think you got it, you, you got it perfectly. We, we must meet the people where they are. And we have to be mindful of logistics, especially now in the era of, of COVID-19. So that has uh, definitely caused us to reevaluate a lot of things and just kind of reassess, which is totally fine. But it is, it is important for us to go to the people where they are as much as we can help it to, to be on their space, on their time to, to go through this process. And, and when I talk about the, the practices, the cultural practices, we, we must be culturally uh, responsive. We must be culturally respectful, more so than responsive, respectful. So whatever it is about the spaces that we occupy, the communities that we are bringing together, <clears throat> excuse me, that will make it easier for them to undergo this process, that's what we will do. And we recognize that we serve as a model. So as David mentioned, yeah, first of its kind in the United States to do this on a state level. We have other restorative justice entities, restorative practice entities, truth and reconciliation entities, whether they're just local coalitions or whether they're international or national who are looking at us uh, and looking at the processes that we are undertaking with this work. So we are setting precedent. We are creating a paradigm. That means we must think of these uh, all aspects of our work very, very carefully and very thoughtfully to, to leave a, a blueprint for those who will come after us to, to elevate this work to another level. So when it comes to our hearings, they, we don't want them to feel like a trial. We, we don't want it to feel like someone is in court. We want it to feel like someone's in a space where they can tell their truth, their truth will be respected, their truth will be understood and appreciated. And that in itself begins the process of healing. I, I know it sounds too good to be true, but again, think of those times where you've told a story that may have been difficult and think about how much better you may have felt afterwards doing that in a collective space where there can be, again, a facilitation of those feelings, those emotions, and we would anticipate them being very strong. That is the process by how we, we get to better clarity of how we can navigate our individual and collective lives together, even after such a, a collection of traumatic experiences as racial terror lynchings were. And I got a really, another really interesting question in the chat um, to, um, to pose directly to Maya, but also for us um, collectively, uh, the, not just the trauma that looking at these incidences might have on the community or descendants, but how about from the perspective of, of an archivist and a historian to, to read, to really dig into the particulars of these cases, you know, does that bring up a certain trauma in, in the researcher, you know, particularly um, from what perspective you're coming from. So I wonder if you had thoughts Thanks about that. Thanks for asking that question, David. Um, I have to say there is a trauma connected to it. Um, I, before I got into the piece with the lynchings, I had definitely had great experience looking at 19th century slavery and, you know, just knowing and being familiar with the punishments that were given out to enslaved individuals. The way in which um, I've seen information with lynchings, I guess because we can visualize it through photography or the way that Sherilyn Eiffel writes about it um, from an oral history tradition that was uh, shared with her in her book on the courthouse lawn. 
I mean, there were times when I had to close that book and I couldn't move any further. It literally took maybe weeks or a month to kind of pick it back up. And it's just one of those things is like reliving the moment, even though you weren't there, there's just a great trauma. And, you know, when you're especially doing it all the time, like when it's right now, it has been a large focus of the work that we do. So you're looking at it all the time and you have to kind of give yourself mental breaks from that because it, it really is hard and heavy material to take on. And as Will kind of spoke about moving into that community work of looking at the long-term effects of systemic racism, and we see it, we see it in our state. Um, we see it in different communities across the state. Uh, I live in Prince George's County. I know what systemic racism has looked like for black people in what is probably one of the largest minority counties in our state. Um, and what that looks like, I've done work on the Eastern shore. Uh, we've met with different family members um, over time. So just knowing that it really is traumatic and you know, it's just really no easy way to do this work. It's just very complex. And I and I wanna, you know, continue moving in the direction of, of those kind of calls to action and, and next steps of, of the commission as well as um, the memorial project. But uh, we did have a question specifically for Will, which I think will kind of help us make that transition um, toward our, our last components here a little bit. Um, but with the EJI, um, setting up the National Memorial um, in, uh, in Montgomery. Um, are there any efforts, and some folks might not know about that, so maybe, Will, you could give a little context um, connected to that background, but how does Maryland maybe connect to that national effort through the EJI? And then furthermore, what are some of the other ways that um, either markers or you know, other commemorative pieces are being planned here in Maryland? So um, yeah, there, the, the uh, EJI um, kind of defines three different, what they call community remembrance projects. And that's what they work with local coalitions on um, projects to help raise awareness in the community about the crimes that have occurred there. The first would be the soil collection. And you know, um, that is what it sounds like. The soil is collected from uh, these lynching sites, they're usually very somber and profoundly moving um, ceremonies. The soil is um, placed in um, uh, you know, these large mason jars and uh, it's on display actually in, at the museum in, in Montgomery. Um, we're also making plans to create a space to do that in, in Maryland, more on that later. Um, and then the next kind of community remembrance project it would be a historic marker. Um, where it would also it would be um, you know installed at the site of the lynching and it tells the story of the lynching that occurred there as well as uh, on the other side the the, the, the general story about lynching uh, racial terror lynchings um, in America and to date one of those markers has been installed in Maryland it's in Annapolis right across from the Arundel Center um, but I'm happy to say I'm proud to say that we're uh, there are two more markers that are going to be installed in Maryland um, in the month of May. On May 8th, there will be a marker installed um, at the old Baltimore County Jail in Towson, which was the site of um, the 1885 lynching of Howard Cooper. I'm not sure if we're going to get to that film or we'll ever want to do that. But and then in April, and then in my, on May 22nd, there is going to be another marker installed in Salisbury. Uh, there were three lynchings in Salisbury, and it's part of um, and those those will be commemorated there. The, um, the thing, I think the, um, the, um, the monuments that um, I think the questioner was referring to, um, at the, um, I, I think probably most of the people on this call probably have seen the pictures of the um, monument uh, memorial in, in Montgomery. It's a series of columns, long columns that are, um, that are hung in each one um, in this space. And each one of those represents a county where racial terror lynchings occurred. That memorial itself is surrounded by a duplicate set of columns, and the intent is, um, the hope is, is that counties will go and collect the column that corresponds to their um, county and repatriate it um, at home, have it installed someplace um, uh, appropriate, and um, and it would be a permanent reminder of of what happened there. There is no protocol yet that's been announced for that. I, I do believe they're going to try and get that going um, this this year, 
Um, but that's, um, stay tuned for that. It, it, the, none of those have happened yet, but that's, that's the intent. And we did have a, another comment that St. Mary's County had their soil collection in 2019 and are on track with EJI to erect a historic marker at the old jail museum in Leonardtown this June. So again, yes. some of that local grassroots work is, is very much underway. Um, we are working in parallel with that from a commission perspective, but we are at about 1245. So Will, I do want to um, give the opportunity to, to show a bit of one of your documentary films, um, which is about Howard Cooper, you, who you just alluded to earlier, um, who was a, a, a very young victim um, in 1885. So I don't know if you want to frame that a little bit, and then uh, we'll give the audience the opportunity to view a bit of that yeah. film. Yeah, sure. Let me just give a little backstory here. In 1880, many of you may know the Valley Inn on Falls Road in, in, in Baltimore County. Right across from that, on, across Falls Road, there's a house that used to be a railroad station. Um, and it still looks like a railroad station. And in, in 1885, um, a young woman had just dropped her sister off at the railroad station. She was walking back to her family farm through the woods and an incident occurred um, with uh, Howard Cooper, a man named Howard Cooper. Um, he was subsequently caught. He was tried in Baltimore City. He was convicted of um, assault and rape, uh, even though he denied having raped her and the, and the victim never actually um, testified that she was raped. Nonetheless, he was convicted of rape, and the reason that is important is because it triggered the death penalty. Um, so he made an appeal to the Court of Appeals um, in, um, in Maryland uh, based on his 14th Amendment rights. There were no blacks on the jury. They actually weren't even, this, it was rigged uh, in, in Maryland at that time. Um, and then he was planning a, um, they were planning an appeal to the US Supreme Court um, on, on the same grounds, and that's kind of where we'll pick up the story. So let me. So we have to take matters in our own hands. By this time, they've been just chomping at the bit to get their chance to lynch Howard Cooper. And they did not want to wait any longer. The next day was Sunday, July 12th. Rumors start to filter through, through the town that something is going to happen soon. In twos and threes, men collect on the outskirts of town. One man pulls a rope out from underneath his jacket, says, this is a cravat for Howard Cooper. As darkness gathers, groups of masked men converge on the jail. The mob waits until Monday morning, actually 12 midnight, Sunday to Monday, because they didn't want to do a lynching on a Sunday. Just after midnight, a group tries to batter the front door using a flagpole. From the family quarters on the second floor, the sheriff's daughter directs them to the back. There, the mob has an easier time of it. They break the door down, find Cooper hiding under a mattress in his cell, and drag him outside with a noose already around his neck. They waste no time tossing the rope over the branch of a nearby sycamore tree. One witness says, the whole affair was orderly and expeditious. And about 40 men pull on one end, lifting Howard Cooper off the ground. He dies of asphyxiation. Usually um, hanging somebody is quick. It breaks somebody's neck. Uh, but in this case, it's a long uh, process of suffocation. The local paper's account begins the Cooper case has been summarily disposed of without the intervention of the Supreme Court. By three in the morning, the mob had disbanded, leaving Cooper's body hanging in front of the jail in full view. Uh, we know that a train slowed down uh, so that their passengers could look out and see the body. This would have been about seven o'clock in the morning. His mother came and collected his body around noon that day, put it in a buckboard and brought it to the church um, on Bologna Road in Ruxton, where he lies today in an unmarked grave. That might have been the end of the story, 
But renewed interest in these lynchings has prompted renewed scrutiny and new revelations. So uh, I went to the soil collection. After the ceremony, historian Jenny Lyles was determined to learn more about the victim and his family. So here's the 1870 census. It is the 9th district, which is Towson Town. I found him in the 1870 census with his mother, his grandparents, and his twin brother. At the time of his lynching, Cooper was said to be anywhere from 19 to 24 years old. The census tells a far different story. So here you can find Henrietta Cooper, says Celeste, Howard, Henry, and Howard and Henry, it's six out of 12, so six months. He was six months old. Then by 1885, that means he could have only been 15 years old, no more. And that was rather shocking to me, that he, I was no longer looking for a man of 25, that I was looking at a kid. Today, Towson is the Baltimore County seat, a legal center, and a college town. But in 1885, a child was lynched here. What we do with that knowledge, that truth, will determine the kind of community our own children inherit. In order for us, if we're going to, you know, have any meaningful reconciliation, any meaningful progress in, in race relations, we have to understand and know that history. It's too important not to know. Thank you for sharing that, Will. And, and I think it's a good way of giving a sense of how further research is ongoing, but also those kind of ways that the public can get involved. So if you wanna just reiterate real quickly what's going on with the, the Howard Cooper situation in Baltimore County, and then we'll, we'll try and fit in one more public question before we uh, start to wrap up. Yeah, sure. I'm, and I missed the beginning of that because the sound crossing over, but um, so yes, the, uh, I just wanna also mention that, you know, that how important it was uh, you know, Maya was talking about, about before about how important it is to continue to research and continue to look into that. And we would not have known how young he was, Howard Cooper, if had not that woman, um, uh, Jenny Lynn Lyles, um, done that research after being at that ceremony. So to me, that just underscores the importance of continuing to look at this. Um, so uh, yes, there is gonna be a, um, a marker installation on May 8th at 11 o'clock at the old Towson Jail. The best place to go for um, information about that would be our website, um, which I think someone posted, but it's easy to Google, you'll find it. Um, and um, uh, you know, we'll be announcing more details uh, as we get closer. Obviously right now things are a little tentative because of the COVID situation, but it is our expectation that we will go ahead and have that ceremony on May 8th. Uh, and so um, we, we, look, we look forward to that. Thank you, I, I look forward to that too. And. Uh, just a, a, a final question to try to fit in here, and I'll, I'll direct it to David, but you know, obviously others can, can chime in. Um, how will the upcoming hearings hold or minister to the likely traumatic responses of individual attendees? Uh, the ritual soil collection helps in that way because it's, it's reverential, but hearings sound more academic. So kind of, I guess like, what's the human element that we're gonna try to build into the hearings? And I know that's kind of an ongoing conversation Right, it is, and kind of what I alluded to when I last spoke, again, the cultural practice of the different regions and the states that we'll be going to is, is critical. It has to be, our approach has to be culturally respectful. I won't say culturally sensitive, I know I say culturally responsive, but respectful. We, we are coming into their space to, you know, uplift their truth, and, and this particular truth is not easy, as, as Maya alluded to. This is hard work. This is this is the stuff that, I mean, if anybody's been paying attention to, to where this country's been going, this is the stuff the country needs. And these are gonna be the harder aspects of that work to really get us to where we feel this country and our people should be. So part of that process is, is making this hearing, and, and I'm sure we'll find another, a better name for it, but for hearing for the time being, to, to be a space of healing that that is the critical word of this whole process. I, I know it's not in our name, but it, it it really should be. It really should be 
this is about the healing of, of the communities that have dealt with this terror in one way or another for generations. And we are not naive to that reality. It is as much about elevating the injustices of the day as it is about respecting and chronicling the injustices of the past and ultimately showing the connection between the two. That is also a critical aspect of our work. So the, the space that we are, are looking to hold is, is for the betterment of the people. That's the one thing that we want to emphasize through all this. Yes, the victims, yes, the perpetrators, yes, the spectators. You can't tell me that you haven't been affected by this in one way or another, no matter what side of, of the act you're on. And, and that is something that we're facing. How do we get the perpetrators out? You know, the sentence of perpetrators, the sentence of spectators. Spectators, is there some that are, that are still alive and willing to tell a story? We want that. This is, the, the act is not up for debate. So let me make that clear. There's, that's already been decided. What conversations and what actions we can have is dealing with the ramifications that all people have dealt with when it comes to a racial terror lynching. Uh, there was a video I saw a, a year or so ago, the daughter of a, a participant in a lynching. Uh, it affected her and she didn't want that, she didn't want that shame. She didn't want to, uh, not address uh, that aspect of, 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 her, of her trauma. So we want that for, for everyone who is looking to, to be healed of this collection of moments and, and to deal with, again, the injustices that create moments just like this, even today. So that must be done again in, in a way that is reflected of the people that we're looking to, to help and to serve. I would piggyback on that, David, too, um, because I was kind of looking at the chat. I didn't know if we were supposed to be answering the chat or if they were going to be brought up in the conversation. But I did um, see that question um, by Reverend Diane Tykert about ministering. So as the chair of the logistics committee, like we're charged with uh, what the day will kind of look like um, in regards to the public hearings. The hearings is what you know, we decided to call these uh, meetings or gatherings um, through the legislation. So that was already in place. But uh, one of the things that the Logistics Committee is paying very close attention to is making sure that we involve trauma specialists who can be there to help people work through these moments. And I think that's going to be very critical to, uh, you know, moving towards healing, as David said, and also just having someone on hand who understands how to deal with trauma. That's not my background. What I bring to the table is research. So we wanna make sure that we have all the critical people there that need to be on spot. And, um, you know, when you, I think about ministering to the people, I think about um, no matter what your religious affiliation or background, uh, in your text, there's trauma. Whatever text that you abide by, there's trauma there. And, you know, we kind of, work through that through hearing and telling the truth of that. And so I think that's very important when we look at things like lynchings. And that's where the public comes into play too. So we, we certainly welcome everybody who's joined us here today to, um, to visit the respective commission and memorial project websites, particularly with the, with the commission, um, looking at those ways to contact us and say, um, you know, this is an expertise that I might bring to the table um, as a social worker, as some sort of trauma expert, um, and, you know, how, help build that coalition of, of people that are going to make this as productive an effort as it can possibly be. So um, I just want to thank um, our three panelists, my colleagues here. I think it was a wonderful conversation. Um, and we, we've got some, a lot of work to do still um, in these coming years, but um, I think sharing that information far and wide is gonna gonna be to our benefit and and help move toward that community healing and and acknowledgement that we're looking for. Um, I will echo um, David's thanks. Um, thank you, David, Will, and Maya for giving your time. We really appreciate it. Um, I hope everyone found this this program today to be insightful and um, maybe to. Um, encourage you to get involved um, and to learn more about this history. Um, I want to thank you all for joining um, and special thanks to those of you who made an optional donation upon registration. Uh, we've raised over $380 and counting um, and this money allows us to continue producing programs like this one and facilitating these conversations. So 
Thanks again. Um, as a reminder, one of the great benefits of being a member at the Maryland Center for History and Culture is priority registration and exclusive member only events. Head to our website, mdhistory.org, to check out all of our member benefits and to sign up. Um, I also want to mention I know somebody in the QA brought up um, schools and educators um, attending these programs. Um, a lot of K through 12 educators very clearly face particular challenges when addressing um, the painful history of lynching and racially motivated violence um, with young learners. And so um, in a couple of weeks, David um, and the rest of our education department will be working with the education department at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum um, to offer a free virtual teacher workshop. Um, participants will gain access to oral history interviews um, and primary sources like photographs, newspapers, and manuscripts um, to create some um, lesson plans to deal with this topic. Um, so if you're an educator or um, you know an educator or you're just interested, um, please sign up for this program um, on our website, mdhistory.org. And lastly, I'll just mention um, that this program was recorded. We'll send out a follow-up email in the next couple of weeks with um, a link to rewatch in addition to all of the wonderful resources our panelists mentioned today so that you can further your education on this topic um, and get involved and hopefully attend some of these upcoming hearings that um, Will referenced. So thank you all so much. We really appreciate your time and um, take care. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.